All right, well, good morning. This is a uh, fitting subject to discuss since we've been going over the uh, evangelism uh, training course with Russ on uh, in the Sunday School Hour. It's really good material, helps you uh, be prepared to share the gospel and to, to not be ashamed of what you believe. You know, that's something that I think many of us struggle with. It's an issue of getting a question posed to you about uh, Christianity, getting a question posed to you about the Bible, and you, and you don't want to offend people, but at the same point, you want to answer their question truthfully, and you want to use the Word of God to do so. Uh, you know, one of the things that's come up lately, uh, I don't know if you guys follow any Christian blogs or kind of stay up to date on what's going on in, uh, in the Christian world circle, but uh, how many of you guys know who Bill Nye the Science Guy is? Yes? Been a science guy. I don't think I watched him very much growing up. I think I, I don't know. I just I think that was maybe a little bit past my time. Uh, but Bill, not the science guy. He had uploaded a video recently. Anybody see that particular video? It's called uh, "Creationism is not appropriate for children." That's the that's the topic of his uh, of his video. So he makes some quotes in this video that are. <laughs> I'll just I'll read you a couple of them because I'd like to be accurate in what he says. He says, your world becomes fantastically complicated if you don't believe in evolution. And then after railing on some other uh, issues of creationism, he says the following. He says, in another couple centuries, I'm sure that worldview won't even exist. There's no evidence for it. So, And he stops there. Well, you know, there's a very famous apologist by the name of Ken Ham. I'm sure many of you guys have heard who he is. He's got a, a program run called Answers in Genesis, and he goes through and he answers a lot of questions from the Word of God. Uh, he doesn't have some super-duper pedigree or anything like that, but he does study the Word of God, and he uh, has kind of uh, offered to do a discussion or a, I don't want to use the word debate, but it kind of is a debate uh, with Bill Nye about creationism. And, you know, what's really funny is, is these individuals, they are very anti-religion. That's a big thing of what they are. They, all, they would all claim to be atheists. We're atheists. We're against organized religion and all of those things as well. But they all have something in common. They are part of religion, a group or set of beliefs themselves. Even though they speak so heavily against religion, they are part of a religion. You know what the religion is the foundation of? It's called science. And their gods and their prophets are people like Neil Tidegrassi, Carl Sagan, uh, Richard Dawkins, the rest of these guys. And I've used a couple of these quotes, uh, and I want to I give a, one of them to you here, uh, so that we can kind of start talking about this issue of confidence, which is really important. And, and the reason, uh, as I've laid out here, there's a formula for it, which we'll discuss. And if you use this formula, this is a formula from God's Word, you can't have confidence about what you believe. And so let me, let me read you this real quick here. Richard Dawkins is being interviewed here. And Richard Dawkins, uh, everybody would say he is uh, a high, higher up in, uh, in the atheist circles. He's written such books as The, as the God Delusion. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read any of those. But, you know, their, their God is knowledge. Their God is science. Paul calls it science so falsely called because science really is just another word for, for knowledge. So when posed the question during a, uh, a video, uh, it was kind of called Expelled. I don't know if you've seen it. Ben Stein, anybody familiar with that guy? He kind of goes through and he, uh, he, he's, he, he's making the, the case for intelligent design, not even uh, an issue of God, really. He's, a, he's Jewish, but he says, you know, I just, I just want to lay the foundation of, of a designer here with Dawkins. And uh, he says to Dawkins, is, it, is there a possibility, you know, is there a possibility, Richard, that that there could be, could be a God, that there could be a designer. And I don't know if you've ever heard Richard Dawkins talk before, but he's, uh, he's got his British accent, and he, uh, I won't try to do it, but he, it's hard for me not to do it because I always want to imitate him and mock him. He says, well, uh, it could come about in the following way. This is an exact quote I wrote down from the, from the video. It could come about in the following way. It, it could be that... Uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a, a civilization uh, evolved. By probably by some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this planet. Um, um, now that is a possibility and uh, um, uh, an intriguing possibility. And I suppose it's also possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at, um, at the, detail, uh, the detail of our chemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. These are his own words. Um, and that designer could be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe, but that higher intelligence would itself would have to be uh, come about from some explicable or ultimately explicable process, and it couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's, that's the point. 
And, and we know that some sort of event must have happened for that to create the origin of life. And that's the exact quote. You can get it. You can watch the video. So does that sound like somebody who knows what he's talking about? Does that sound like somebody who's knowledgeable? I mean, really think about that for a second. This guy's Richard Dawkins. I mean, he is the man. I mean, you go, go research, type in atheist in Google, and probably the first thing you're going to get is Richard Dawkins' a Wikipedia article. You know, I mean, he is a very high up in this, in this religion of atheism. Well, he grew up uh, in, a, uh, in kind of like an Anglican type of church, and of course, he's very anti-God. And it's very, it's very uh, uh, in particular, he's anti-against the uh, Judeo-Christian God. Well, about this origin of life, Ben asked him a question. He goes, well, what was that? How did this origin of life happen? What, what was it? In Dawkins' sense, it, it was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. They use big words. They like to do that all the time because they make up their own words in which they define them themselves. Ben says, right, well, how did that happen? Dawkins says, I I've told you, we don't know. Uh, so you have no idea how it started? No, no, nor has anyone. So this concept that somebody actually has knowledge, I mean, please, please, when, you're, when, you, when you want to get some confidence about this issue of, of being able to talk to people, yeah, they can come up with big words, they can make things happen, but I want to tell you the word of God is quick, it's alive, it's very powerful, and it can pierce, and it's very good how you use it. Now, we, we don't, we're not out here just trying to get in debates with atheists, that's not my goal, that's not my desire. I didn't even bother quote, uh, posting on this particular blog, uh, it was filled with all types of, uh, of issues about this particular subject with the whole Bill Nye issue, but uh, you see the truth that they unfortunately suppress and they hold down in their unrighteousness. And this kind of leads me to the topic I want to discuss with you all today, and it is confidence, right? Now, some people always have a problem with confidence because they unfortunately think confidence equals arrogance, and that's not true. It can be true. Confidence can be arrogance, but we want to make sure that we are not arrogant in what we believe. We are confident, but not arrogant. We're confident, and I'm confident today in telling you that there is a God. I'm confident in the Bible, confident in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm confident about uh, what he says in his scripture. As many of us kind of progress in an understanding, right, we, we, I would say the most of us here, I've, I've, I think I know many of you, uh, we, many of us here placed our faith and trust in Christ. We know that his death, burial, and resurrection has paid for all of our sins, and that through that we have eternal life. And as we move through here, and we kind of we kind of move past these basic doctrines of justification, the basic doctrines of, of salvation, we kind of progress, and we should want to progress in an understanding. Sometimes we, we get things in the way, and we don't necessarily get far as we want to get, and uh, there's different levels that I meet people on every, every day. I get somebody, and I'm like, man, wow, this guy knows a lot. We've, we really need to, he's teaching me a lot of things, and sometimes it's, it's the role reversal, and, and I'm, I'm teaching them. But as we go, we should want to de develop a desire to understand the scriptures, which then will create in us a very real, rich, deep confidence because it's not a confidence that's based in ourselves, but it's a confidence that's based in Christ, in what Christ says, and what he has done for us. So when I first, uh, you know, began to study God's word, this is several years ago now, about three years, I don't know, many of you guys know who I am, but, uh, you know, I was saved May 9th, 1989, I was four years old, and I remember coming back from VBS and saying, I think I've done some really bad things, and, um, the guy was kind of right. I, I think I've offended God. And I was, a, I was a smart little whippersnapper, and I said, you know, Mom, I, I, I want to trust Christ for eternal life. I want to make sure I go to heaven. And so, you know, that was, that was the day. And, and like I, Russ said today, I've never really doubted my salvation. never really thought, oh, wow, because I was taught early on the doctrines of grace. And grace is what produces such great confidence because grace is not of merit. Make sense? So if it's not of merit, then what? What are you worrying about? You have great, great confidence in grace. So this passion kind of built up in me, and, and it's been here for the last about three years. Uh, I've really, I've been, I've been teaching at Suncoast. I've been having the Bible studies. And it's because I've been given an obligation uh, to teach the message, but it's, it's not just an obligation. Uh, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to talk about God's word. It's a privilege to stand up here and, and discuss what I believe. And I want to make sure it's very clear to everybody here that what I preach from the pulpit, it's not rhetoric. It's not something I just come up here and I want to preach something random. I, I preach it because I, I genuinely do believe it. And I believe it to be God's word and I believe it to be very important. You know, a friend of mine, uh, we were sitting there studying for an exam. And while we were studying for the exam, something came up, the Bible, God, Christ. And you know, I just was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this one home. I'll just, I'll see what I can do. 
so my friend Brian, he's sitting there across the table from me. We're studying for an exam, and we're kind of take a break, and he, he asked me a question about the Bible. Because, I mean, I have Bibles. I have Bible verses on my walls. You know, there's, there's things that you're going to see, and, okay, you Christian, what is this? So I begin to describe and to, and to talk to him about what I believed. And I went through it uh, for about 20 minutes or so. And at the end of it, he looked at me, and he's, I mean, I kid you not, he looks at me just like this. He's got his, like, very inquisitive look. He looks at me, and he goes, he goes, you really believe this, don't you? And I said, yeah. He goes, like, 100%. I said, absolutely, I 100% believe what I just told you. And he goes, you know what? I'm, I'm jealous of what you have. And I said, great, this is the perfect opportunity. If you're jealous of it, I can give it to you. I'm not holding it back. And I said, here, you can have the exact same thing. And unfortunately, it doesn't have a happy ending. He, he, he kind of was like, but I'm not sure if it's for me. You know, I didn't fail at my job that day, and I, I tell people that. I didn't fail at my job. But what I, think was, what I think was alarming for him, number one, I demonstrated him what? I demonstrated love to him and sharing him the gospel. I didn't do it condescendingly. I, I, just, I just openly told him what I believe about what the Bible says about sin, death, judgment, and ultimately about salvation. And I think that in sharing the gospel, because I did it so confidently, that was like, whoa, nobody ever does that. Nobody ever actually talks to me, like, especially about God. I mean, people have said things about God or about the Bible. He's even said this, but, but not with the extent of the, the confidence that you have about if you really believe this. And that was, that was the shocking aspect of it. And as, as we discuss confidence, the formula is the following. We start off first with a trustworthy object. We'll learn that that's not yourself. Yourself is not a trustworthy object. You can have confidence in the flesh, and Paul will discuss that, and we'll look at that. You then have faith or trust in that object. You have full persuasion, that's results, as a result of having the trustworthy object and faith in it, which then in turn produces the ultimate confidence. So go ahead and, uh, and turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 116, and we'll open up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, we love you. We thank you for the time we have to discuss your word. We thank you for the time to preach and to uh, teach, and uh, that this will be edifying to the members of the body of Christ, Lord. And if there are any here today, Lord, that do not know for certain that if they were to die, they have eternal life, Lord, let's make sure that is very clear in the message presented through the gospel of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in everything, and through his name we pray. Amen. So can you say the following, I am confident? Well, in what? Can you use that word alone? Can you say, I'm confident? Doesn't something have to necessarily precede that, right? Or you have to say, well, in what? Or, or how? How are you confident, right? If I just walked up to you one day and I never met you before and say, I am confident, somebody would say, well, that doesn't really make any sense. That's not really a, a good place to start, right? Is it a self-confidence? Is it a confidence about something in particular? Well, the trustworthy object that we have to understand and we have to know is we have to know who God is. And now God is portrayed, as Richard Dawkins portrays him, as a mean, bigoted, hateful, spiteful, evil creature, a figment of our imagination, who hates all men, desires to, you know, he goes through this whole big rant in the introduction of his God Delusion book. Well, that's not the God that I find in the Bible. I find a righteous God, a God who loves mankind, and ultimately demonstrated that on the cross. And that's really the whole picture and the whole message of the entire Bible. When you look at it in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a big regard, in, in the total big picture, that's what we talk about. Well, in Psalm chapter 116, let's discuss this just for a second here. Psalm 116, you know, David is charged with some, uh, some pretty heinous offenses, adultery, and uh, number two was murder. So as having two capital crimes, adultery and murder, what does that mean for him? Capital crimes equal death. Um, there's no law that says, oh, David, you get out of that one. You're, you get scot-free, no worries, you're good. And David is... He's freaking out, for lack of a better term. He's worried about dying, about being put to death as the king because of what he has done, his transgressions. And so he's like, man, this is not good. What am I going to do? He's like, my law, the law is not going to help me. What am I going to have to do? What does he do? He pleads for mercy, right? Mercy is something that, you know, look, I know I deserve it, but can I get a break? 
right? There's a difference between mercy and grace. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve, even above it. Mercy is, is not getting what you do deserve. You see how that works? So mercy, get, not getting what you do deserve. Grace is not getting what you do deserve. But you also get something in addition to it, right? So in Psalm chapter 116, he's talking about the sorrows. He says the sorrows of death. He's really talking about having to die for, for his transgressions. And he looks and he says, in verse number 5, he says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low. Where was he brought low? In his, in his sin and his transgression. He's like, man, I was brought to the ground. I didn't know what I was going to do. And he says, the Lord preserved the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Not that I helped myself, because there was nothing he could do to help himself. There's nothing he could do to get himself out of the position he was in. He was in big, big trouble. And he knew that. And that's why he goes, God, uh, I'm, I'm in trouble. And look what he says in verse number 7. This is, this is the statement that he makes. This is after he's already understood in Psalm 100 in chapter uh, 3, where he says the, the Lord has removed his transgressions as far as the east is from the rest, that God has taken care of him. He's just kind of almost going through a lamenting process or a venting process. Uh, that's kind of how the whole book of Psalms kind of gets broken down. But he says in verse number 7, Return unto thy rest. He tells his soul, O oh, my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully, with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from failing or falling. And who did that? That God did that for him. Not anything he could do. He was in a position of absolute despair. Verse number nine, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. That sounds like a pretty confident statement, doesn't it? Isn't that a confident statement for a man who should be who should be killed? He says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Yeah. And, and why is, why, how does he get to that position where he's actually able to say that? Well, he says that as he tells you in verse 10, I believe. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I mean, you really shouldn't be preaching. You shouldn't be teaching anything that you don't believe. If you don't believe it, then don't speak it. Right? This trustworthy object here is God, and God, his word, who had promised David, said, look, dude, your sins, your sins are completely taken care of. In so much, look at Romans chapter number four. Let's look how much he took care of those sins for David. And this is what Paul has to say about David and his transgressions. He says the following. In Romans chapter number four, this whole passage in Romans chapter 4 is talking about that the law is of no possibility to save you, that the issue of justification, the issue of your righteousness comes only in one way, one shape, one form, in all ages, and that's by faith, without works. And even David understood that. And David here uh, is being quoted. Paul says in Romans chapter number 4, verse 6, uh, let's look at verse number 5, because this makes a little more sense. He says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And so Ab uh, David had believed God, and God had taken care of his transgressions. Verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness, that's righteousness that's of God, without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Well, is it temporarily? No. He says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. See, David being a man after God's own heart because he believed God. And, Abra and uh, David was justified the same way that Abraham was justified by grace through faith. Now, the object of that faith varies. We do understand that, that if you looked at the chart here, Abraham and David did not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for their sins. No, he did not understand that. But what they did understand is they believed God, and they, they knew their own self-worth was not very much. So this, this issue here, as David says, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, this had a profound impact on the Apostle Paul. He knew this piece of scripture in so much that he actually quotes it for us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. This will kind of be our text. If I'm going to you know, pick a text for the day, it's going to be 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. These will be our texts that we're going to stick with for the majority of the message today. And, and these will be very helpful to you to understand um, that God's word is very uh, connected, right? 
it's not like this is, this is so different, so uh, at variance or bifurcated or separate that you're like, man, nothing really works. Uh, it doesn't really ever fit. The picture doesn't really, isn't really clear. Well, that's for many times, many people don't see a clear picture of God's word is because they think that, um, that, that, that everything's just one big gobbledygook mishmash, right? And they haven't taken it and decided to separate it and look and say, well, who was God dealing with at what time? And what was God saying at this particular period of time? Or, or what scripture does this have to, have, to, have to do about, right? And some little things like we've discussed in our, in our Wednesday night Bible study this past week, we went over the issues of, of prophecy versus mystery. And those are some very deep uh, understandings that will really help you grow in a maturity, but will also help you understand your scriptures so that you can be confident in what you say. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Because if you say something and it doesn't come to pass, there's not going to be much confidence in what you have to say. I'm not going to really trust you. If you're telling me that God says, oh, you're going to be better, God's going to heal you, and then you end up dying, well, I don't trust you about that. I don't know if I'm going to trust you about this whole eternal life thing either because you seem to speak words that don't come to pass. And that's important. Well, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, go ahead and turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, if you haven't turned there already, makes the, makes the statement here. He's discussing in, in this passage, and we've got to look, get a little context here, he's troubled. He is definitely distressed. He's a little perplexed. And, and why do you think Paul's a little perplexed and distressed? Well, because everybody wants to kill him, right? He's got a freaking bounty on his head. Everyone's like, let's just kill this guy. We want him done. They want to stamp him out. Because if we stamp him out, then you know what? Then maybe that'll end this whole Christianity thing. I mean, he's really, as he says, he, he is all the churches in Asia. He says he, he ministered to all of them, and all of them had forsaken him. And he's, he's doing as, as best he can with Christ living in him to do, do the work. And look what he says here about being, you know, in this persecution. He says in verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. So he understood, man, I'm going through all these tribulations. I'm going through all these problems. And these are really just the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, aren't they? Aren't they the same things that Christ dealt with? He's like, man, you guys just are beating me up, and you're just killing me. And I'm just trying to bring you eternal life and good news, but you want nothing to do with it because you're of your father, the devil. And so Paul and his fellow comrades, they have experienced some real tribulations, some real persecution, some real suffering, things that we've never, never really experienced. I mean, none of us here today can say, hey, any of you guys here been beaten for your faith? No, not a single person. What is the worst thing that we typically experience as, as Christians today? Somebody says, cuckoo, cuckoo, right? No. You're crazy. You're crazy. Well... Not so much. You know how many times I've had somebody tell me, Jason, you're a really smart guy. And that could build up my confidence in my flesh. But I say, not really. And he says, you're a really smart guy. How do you believe all this stuff? You know, this whole Bible thing. I'm like, well, what do you believe in? Where, where's your faith based in? Don't you have something? You know, I've told the story over and over and over again. People think they have it all figured out. And when I looked at my buddy, and I talked to him this week again, uh, and, and we were sitting there discussing some things, and I asked him, uh, I said, so what's your goal? What's your, what do you want to do with your life? You know, I'm trying to get his understanding. He's a, Jewish, he's a Jewish friend of mine. He says, you know, I surely want to get done with law school. I want to pass the bar. I said, all right, and then what do you want to do? He says, I want to, I want to get a really good job. I said, all right, and what do you want to do? Make a lot of money. I said, okay, and what next? He says, well, you know, I'd probably get a couple million dollar cases down underneath my belt. I said, all right, what next? He's like, probably start my own firm, you know, become a partner. I said, all right, what next? He's like, early retirement. I said, all right, what next? He goes, oh, you know, then, uh, I don't know, probably play a lot of golf, hang out with the grandkids, you know, that kind of stuff. I said, all right, what next? And he looks at me, and he's like, uh, I mean, I guess I'll just continue to play some golf and take vacations and have a good time. And I said, yeah, what next? And he goes, I guess I got to die. <laughs> and he knows where I'm going with it. He knows. I, we've had this discussion. And I said, yeah, and what next? And this is a guy, and we laugh about this, but it's so true. It's a guy who will tell you from his own mouth that he's going to hell. But he just, ah, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure about this whole Christianity thing. I mean, I sat there and I said, dude, you're, you're, you're a Jew. Let me explain to you how this, this uh, individual, Jesus Christ, is your Messiah. Let me show you how this is not some weird thing. He had no clue, no clue, not a clue, that he was waiting for a Messiah, and he's a Jew. Okay? So don't give people the benefit of the doubt that they actually understand anything. Don't give people the benefit of doubt that, oh, they already know about Jesus. 
Yeah, they've heard about Jesus before, but they have no about de- de- idea about his saving grace. They have no idea about his death and what that means for us today and how it's the best news that we could ever have. So Paul, obviously this, this scripture had a profound impact that, that I said that I believe and therefore have I spoken. He's, he's, he's distressed. I mean, he was stoned at Lystra. He's cast into prison. He's been shipwrecked. Uh, he's been beaten. He's seized by a mob. He's eventually killed and martyred for his faith, right? And through all that, none of it moved him. Acts 20. He says, didn't even, didn't even, didn't even blink an eye. And how do you get to that point? Don't you want to be there too where you're just like, it doesn't really matter? Where you're just like, it's okay. I mean, you can have a relative or a friend die who who is saved and you just go, well, great. Praise the Lord. I'm glad he's in heaven. I'm sad that we're we're not going to see him for a little while, but we know about his eternal destiny and where he's going. Well, in in 2 Corinthians Corinthians 4, verse 13, look what he says then. In verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith, he's talking about the spirit of faith that that David had, the same issue, the same issue of faith, of belief, all of these things precede confidence, they all build up confidence, confidence is trust, confidence is faith, confidence is belief, all those things make up confidence. He says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written. So who is he going to speak back to? Whenever you see that word, according as it is written, we've got to go back and figure out the story, because there's more to it than just that little piece of according as it is written. Let's get the big, full understanding. And we kind of saw a little bit of that in Psalm 116 with David, right? We see that what? He was at despair. He's like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. But he says, rest, my soul. You're good. God has dealt bountifully with you. I will walk in the land of the living. And he says, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. That's Paul quoting David in Psalm. Paul says, after the semicolon there, we also believe, and therefore... What do you do when you believe? You, you speak what you believe. And today, I, I believe that the scripture and what it says about confidence is very important. I said you should never preach anything that you don't believe. And I don't get up here and I'm not going to preach something that I don't believe. I wholeheartedly believe it. And this is what my friend Brian, that guy I was talking to you about in the very beginning, what he saw when we discussed, he saw some confidence, and I really, actually, I, I, I believe I opened the Bible and we started going through some verses with him. And it was funny, because then actually the next day, uh, my other friend Tony came over, he came to study, and then Tony starts asking me some questions, and he starts going through things left and right. He was, he was raised Catholic, so we're going back and forth. And so, it, then, then it was Josh, Tony, and Brian, where all three of us are there the next day, and we're all studying for this exam, and about at every, you know, 30 minutes, we have about an hour of Bible lessons and Bible to study, trying to go over these things. And so all we're doing is we're planting these seeds, we're watering, we're giving them some information, and uh, it's just so amazing to me that these people, they've never, they've never really heard the truth. That, that's, that's like, I think that we, we unfortunately take it for granted that many, oh, they, they go to church, they know about the Bible. Well, maybe, but it's more likely that they, they don't necessarily understand everything. So let's, let's be helpful and not arrogant. I'm saying confidence is, is giving them the true confidence of saying, I have a message for you. The message for you is that you can know and be confident about where you're going to die. When you, when you die, where you're going to go. And let's look at that in just a second with what Paul says. So this confidence is important. It's the same confidence that, that Paul really has. Is the same confidence that we have today. And, and what really is that? Is that really our own confidence? It's not self-confidence. It's, it's Christ. It's the firm understanding of the scriptures which build up in us and edify us. The preaching does the same thing. That's why people come to church. What do you think they come to church for? The preaching is for edification. It's to build up the body. It's so that people will understand and go, okay, yeah, I, I know. I know, what I, need to, I know what I need to go out and do. You're pointing to sp- specific pieces of scripture that you may not have necessarily understood. And that's why each of us are, are, are at different stages in our spiritual maturity and our spiritual growth. So this confidence doesn't come from you because the confidence is not about you. It comes from Christ in you. It's not simply confidence in your flesh, me, Jason Tripp, but rather the more we understand and submit to God's will through an understanding of Jesus Christ, and we understand him how and what particular way. We've been going over this in Bible study that there is a whole way that you can understand Jesus Christ, and it's according to just the prophetic element of him, the prophecy aspect, right? And that's a very helpful understanding of Jesus Christ. And that's what many understand. That's what's preached in, 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 uh, in the book of Matthew. It's preached in the book of Mark, Luke, John. That's Jesus Christ according to prophecy. It isn't until later on that we learn a little bit about a guy named Paul, the chief of sinners, who ushers in what we call the age of grace, the dispensation of grace. 
And as a result, he gives us some great information about some things that were hidden that God had not necessarily revealed in the scriptures of the prophets, but that without understanding them, we can never have full assurance or full knowledge. So we have to understand that what was working in Paul to then is the same thing that's working in us today. That's just simply Christ, and it's Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So in verse number 7, he makes this clear. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure, meaning that what we have right now, the, 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 uh, the, the message of grace, the gospel, as he's talking about in verse number 3, that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, right? Go ahead and look. Let's just read verse 3. Um, you know what? Let's start from the very beginning of chapter 4, verse 1, because let's just get the context down. I like to do this. It just makes it a little easier. He says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. So you have a ministry. You may not have known about it, but as a member of the body of Christ, as a believer, you have a ministry. And part of the ministry, he says, is to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God, it's the scriptures, deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, we put the truth out there. We don't hide it. We commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What is our goal? What are we trying to do? We want every man to see that, yes, this person is sincere in what they believe, that they're presenting them with the truth, and we're, we're manifesting it out there. He says in verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, meaning that if, if this is how Paul is communicating this now, our gospel is how Paul is, is, is breaking this down. It starts off first with Paul preaches in Romans chapter 1, my gospel. Then he says in, in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, it's the gospel of your salvation, and then over here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, he says, it's our gospel. That's when you take Paul's gospel, you believe the gospel as yours, it becomes ours, and you and Paul both become workers in the faith. He says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If somebody's lost, what are they looking for? They're looking for direction. People need direction in their life, and this is how we give it to them. Verse 4, how are they lost? By what way? Well, he says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. Who blinds the minds of people? Well, that's Satan. That's the devil. He blinds them. He makes them think about all kinds of other things in their mind, right? He blinds their minds. So they create all these little ways to, to either please God. They create these little ways that they think that they're going to get to heaven. And what they do is they suppress the, suppress the truth and unrighteousness because they themselves are unrighteous and look to themselves for getting eternal life. And he says, lest the light, this is that issue of, of Christ, of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And how does it shine unto them? Well, our gospel, if it's hid, if we're not pronouncing it for to other people, then it's it's, it's there. I had a friend tell me one time I was talking about the gospel and about salvation. He says, well, that's a personal issue. I said, no. Your salvation is a personal issue. Yes, absolutely. You need to make sure that you are saved. But it's our gospel, and it is definitely not to be hid. We should make sure people understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is very important. Look what he says in verse number uh, 5. And this is this whole issue about it's nothing to do with you has everything to do with Christ. He says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. I mean, the light shines out of darkness. I mean, remember what we used to be. We used to be in darkness. We used to be aliens in our, in our minds. I mean, from, from God, in the way that well, we didn't really think about God in that way until we were presented with the truth of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith. And, and by grace we were saved. And then he says, now you've been translated in the kingdom of his dear son, and you've been made inheritance with the saints and the partakers in light. In Colossians chapter 1, he says, and it has shined in our hearts. So this is something that comes out to give the light of the knowledge. Here's that issue that we're always looking for, what people are striving for, issues of knowledge, right? That's what the atheists say that they have, and we don't. We're just ignorant. You know, they always like to say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That's what they just like to say. All Christians just say that, and I just know that we're just not going to have a good conversation if a Christian says that. Well, Richard Dawkins says it. I believe it. That settles it. You follow me? You see how that's the same thing? It's the same issue. But one has its basis in truth. The other, unfortunately, in deceit. 
It's to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he says, but we have this treasure. This is, this is something treasurous. This is like a gift that we're going to give people. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And this is where we're going to spend a second. Earthen vessels are what? It's our earthly body, right? And why is it called a vessel? Well, the vessel is where God dwells. We're going to look at that in just a second in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So people look at it and they go, well, dude, I know who you used to be. Yeah. Now what I'm seeing now, this is completely different. What's going on with you? Something's changed. Something's different. And that's what happens when the word of Christ dwells in you. It teaches you, and it works effectually in those that believe. So in this sense, right, through all this, he makes it clear that it's what? It's not about you. The fact that we are now able to demonstrate the gospel of Christ to show the world the gospel that they need to believe is, is God's power, and we have confidence in that. It's like, look, dude, you're not, you're not trusting in me. You're trusting in God. I'm just simply the vessel to, to give you the information. This is what Paul discusses in Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, he says the following. He says, for none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Well, that's kind of hard to think about. How does that work, right? He says, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore die, we are the Lord's. And that's not meaning that we are actual Lord's. He says, in the possessory sense, we are the Lord's. And that's where you start to get some super confidence. When you actually realize that you've been bought, you've been paid for, you're taken care of, and God's come back to get you, and that it's not of works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm getting excited. This is good, because I had no confidence before in my flesh, and now I have a whole lot of confidence in things that have already been done and already been taken care of on our behalf, right? So what precedes confidence is knowing about that trustworthy object of your confidence, right? You have to know who that is. And then you have faith in that object. For when you know the object of the confidence, that it's, it's not your flesh, it's Christ, his power of his resurrection, the truth of grace, the mystery, your confidence stands in Almighty God. I mean, it doesn't stand in yourself, and as a result, it's the most unwavering and completely finished work. You know, let me kind of parallel this to self-confidence for a second. Here's a way to have self-confidence and why it, it kind of fails you. <clears throat> self-confidence would be trusting in something that you have done, something that you're, you're accomplishing on the behalf of, of, of your own self to build you up, to make you strong, and say, okay, I now have confidence. You know, when, uh, uh, when the day finally came for me to, to uh, start studying for that, that horrible exam called the bar exam, you know, that's like the, the worst exam that anybody ever wants to take. I was an utter waste of time. I really didn't want to take it, but I took it. I had to take it. I, it was part of my ending process of going to school. You know, you go through that whole thing, and you, and you start studying. And, you know, I wasn't necessarily that worried about it at first. I, I kind of had, I had a healthy fear of it, and I studied for it. And I, I studied, and I studied, and I studied. And eventually, I became confident in my abilities. I became confident in knowing the material, right? I knew exactly what the material was. I knew exactly what the subjects were. I looked at all the past exams. And I, I showed up, my buddy Ian and I, we both showed up to take the exam. And we were pretty chill. I mean, we went, to, we went to dinner the night before. We brought our guitars. We were jamming in the room the night before the exam. We jammed on breaks. And, uh, you know, I walked out of the first exam, and I said, I'm fine. And people were freaking out. People were crying. People were throwing up in the bathroom. I mean, it's just insane. You're like, really? And that's the reason why is because their confidence is just in, oh, I, I hope I can do good. They didn't actually have anything that they studied. They didn't have anything they actually prepared for. They just were like, oh, man, I really should have put more time in, right? Should have done that. And so when that day finally came, I walked away saying confidently that I, I passed the exam. And I did. I did with no problem. And that was, that was because we put the time in. We put, the, we put the, uh, uh, the, the, the study in. And I know. I know you're probably sick of hearing this by now. I mean, we should just call this church Study Bible Fellowship. I mean, right? Shouldn't we just call it that? Because isn't that what we talk about all the time, studying? Well, when you study the scriptures, it produces something in you. It produces confidence. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and I'll show you how this works. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, Paul says the following. In 1 Timothy 4, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, okay, to exhortation. Exhortation is kind of what we're doing right now. You know, you kind of just go over the scriptures and you exhort over them. It's, it's similar to preaching. And he says, and to doctrine. And then he, he follows up in 2 Timothy when he writes to Timothy again. He says, hey, Timothy. He goes, guys, he says, study. 
He says, study to show thyself approved unto God. You know, when Jesus Christ was a man approved of God, do you know how he was approved of God? Well, how do they know that he was a man from God? How do you know that you're a man from God? Well, he did signs, he did miracles, and he did wonders. That's what, that's what Peter says in Acts chapter number 2. He says, he did signs, miracles, and wonders in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. That's how Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man approved of God. How do we get approved of God today? Is it by me going out and saying, oh, um, you know, America, if you turn from your wicked ways, God will hear from heaven and forgive your sin and heal your land. Um, do I, is, that, is that how we're going to get it? I mean, no. This is the problem is that we have a, uh, a, a, a flawed approach too many times about, about where we get our knowledge from and where we get our truth from. The confidence, he says, is right here. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, that's somebody who's doing the work of the ministry, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what is truth? We've said it all along. God's word is truth. Every bit of it from cover to cover. And how do we know it's truth? How do we know it's a trust, trustworthy object? Because as, as, uh, as Titus chapter 1 says, the God that cannot lie. God cannot lie, and as a result of it, his word is true, and it's worthy to be trusted. Well, part of confidence, if you were looking at something to be, if, you're, if, you, have, if you don't have confidence, what would you probably have? I mean, you're kind of like, you're ashamed, right? You're like, well, I'm not really confident in this. I'm kind of ashamed at this. I don't really know what to do. Uh, I, I go back and forth or whatnot. And that's what happens to many because of the lack of rightly dividing. And we understand the importance of it. Uh, Paul says here about shunning profane and vain babblings. That's what happens when you don't rightly divide. You start telling people that the resurrection of the dead is already passed. Oh, it's already done. That's what these guys, Hymenaeus and Philetus, were doing. They were telling everybody, oh, there's no more resurrection. That thing's done. And they're like, what? What? So what are we going to do now? Uh don't really know. Probably should have to make it down to the, to the kingdom at some point in time. And these, these guys, are, they're literally, for lack of a better term, they're freaking everybody out. And they're overthrowing the faith of them because they're taking the word of God and they're not handling it right and they're not handling it uh, uh, not deceitfully. They're handling it deceitfully. And so that's what we want to do. And that's how we always do at Suncoast is the issue of, of what is, is studying. I know you're probably sick of hearing it. Oh, come on. Study, 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 study. Is it really that important? It is. It is. You can't walk into a test, as I've said so many times, and, and plan on doing well. You can't go up to somebody and be like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the gospel with this guy and really get it going. And then he's like, well, dude, how about this? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't really know. And then he asks you another question, and you're like, I don't know that one either. <laughs> and uh, the, the worst thing you can do is they ask you a question, and you're like, well, yeah, um, uh, uh, this here, um, I know it's in here somewhere. Um, you know, God, God said it somewhere in here, and I believe it. That settles it. Well, maybe that was your one opportunity to discuss with them the truth of God's word. And now, like, I looked at you, and you're like, well, oh, he's not a man approved of God. I mean, he's supposedly telling me about these issues, but he can't find it in his own Bible. And that's kind of an issue of reproof, and it's hard, and I myself were there for so long. But, you know, as Paul says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded, right? That's how it happens. You get to find the trustworthy object. You have faith in that object. Paul says, I'm persuaded. I know who he is, that he's going to be able to keep that. And then you have confidence as a result. So as a Christian, there is one thing I hope that you are all very confident about. Because it's one thing that Paul discusses at length back in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Go there for me. He discusses at length this issue. I mean, where he actually says, you should be confident of this. Conf he uses the word confidence. Many places he uses the word trust or faith or believe, which, are, which can also be synonyms for the issue of confidence. But in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, right, the confidence issue here is confidence of being with Christ, the confidence of going to heaven at the point in which your body, as Paul says here, dissolves or it ceases to exist or more bluntly, you die. You kick the bucket, right? We understand that this is to be based upon grace, and thus our security and confidence is pretty resolute because it has nothing to do with us. Isn't that so great? It's like that's why you're confident about where you're going to go. You know, to the Catholic, and, and I, I, I don't come up here, and I don't want to sit here and, and, and rail on other religions. That's not my point. We're not fighting uh, against them. We're fighting for them just to show the truth of God's word. So to the Catholic, they would say this is called presumptuous. This is actually a sin to say that you can know 
you're going to heaven. I actually went to CatholicBasicTraining.com. This is one of their, the Catholic Church, the dioceses of areas, put out this little thing and say, go check this out. And I read the doctrinal statement on the sin of presumption, and they make it very clear that all these issues, blah, 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 and I could go into all the things, but for time, we don't really have that much time and issues on there. But let's just, let's just, with the understanding that they believe it's a sin to be presumptuous. Well, then Paul was committing the sin of presumption, and God himself was helping Paul in this as he inspired these words to write it in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Paul says the following in verse number 5, or verse number 1 of chapter 5. For we know, again, know that trustworthy object. Here's what it is. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, Okay, so the earthly house is what? It's our earthly body. He says, of this tabernacle, well, the understanding of a tabernacle was, quote, unquote, a place where God dwells, right? So if, if, this, if that's the tabernacle and we're a tabernacle of God or maybe the habitation of God by the Spirit, as Paul says, this issue is here. If it were dissolved, it means if it were to go away, if the body's gone, what happens? He says, not a big deal. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So the tabernacle is something that what is temporary. If you compare the differences between the tabernacle and the, and the, and the, uh, and the temple, uh, those are, you know, one is, one is made up of the tent and one is made with stone, and, and we can go from there. But keep going. He says, uh, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So verse number two, for in this we groan. In this what? In this earthly tabernacle, don't we groan? Isn't, isn't like life sometimes like, oh, man. I mean, childbirth, right? <laughs> there you go. I know how that goes. I just, we just had our baby. I don't know personally how that goes, but I, I experienced the uh, secondhand issues of how that worked out. But don't we, don't we groan? And isn't it like earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven? That's our new body. Don't we just go like, man, I mean, we've been told about this new body. It's going to be great. No more sin. No more issues of my, you know, my, my, I can't gain weight. I'm allergic to food. I don't have a gallbladder anymore. All these stupid things that's wrong with me. And, and I'm sure you guys have your own ailments as well. And we have this earnest desire to be, to be clothed. I mean, if you want to make a reference, we're not going to talk about it here right now, but go and just mark in your Bibles 1 Corinthians 15 and go back and read that later uh, to kind of go through that. Verse number 3 says, If so, that being clothed, we shall be not be found naked. So he's making this very clear. He's like, uh, there's never going to be an issue with you being naked. You're not going to not have your body, right? That's what he's saying. So there is a temporary period of time between the rapture and there, but you won't have uh, your, your new body, but it is coming. You'll have it. So that's what he's saying. You're not going to be without a body. So verse number four, he says, for we that are in this tabernacle, again, he's going to make it again, do groan. He's going to say it twice. We're groaning. Ugh. Six o'clock again, right? Everybody has to get up at the same time. Nobody gets up and is all chipper in the morning. That's all a lie. Nobody goes, oh, I feel great. This is awesome. You know? He says this, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. And, and how are we burdened? Well, let's look at this in Romans chapter 8 for me. And hold your place in 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to come back there. Romans 8. He says it like this. Romans chapter 8. Verse number 22. Romans 8, verse number 22 he says, for we know that the whole creation, here's that word again, it groaneth, and it travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, that's talking about the world, but ourselves also. But what? There's a difference. Which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves. This is us deep, at a deeper level, a deeper understanding, doing what? Waiting for the adoption. And the adoption here is the best part. He says, to wit, the redemption of our body. So if you're looking at the redemption of our body, going back here to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look what he says here. Verse number 5, for we that are in this tabernacle do groaned, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed. It's not that we don't want to. We don't want to necessarily have to die. We don't want to necessarily. We're like, oh, I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing. We want to be with Christ, but we don't necessarily want to die. And he says the following: 
not for that we would be unclothed, but our real desire, what we're groaning for, what we're burdened for, is to be clothed upon that mortality. The issue of having to die might be what? Swallowed up of life. How does that work? He's like, well, when you're in your new body, he says, it's eternal in the heavens, right? <clears throat> Compare this with me with Ephesians chapter number 1. <clears throat> And this makes it all really clear. Paul didn't have like a hundred different messages that he preached, you know. I mean, he just had one. I mean, he got up and he preached it. Uh, and if you think I'm kidding, um, no, his messages were like 12 hours long, you know. He would sit there and reason the synagogues for three days, you know. Like, oh, I'm just going to get in there and I'm going to start talking. And he wouldn't stop talking. He'd keep going, he'd go, and he'd go, and he'd go. And Eutychus had to fall out of the ceiling. He's up there and he's like, oh, Paul, you're getting long-winded. He falls out and dies and Paul has to raise him and for the dead. He's not about his life still in him. He's good. He's good. He was, he was at church. It's, it's good. People use that all the time. We'll see if, if Eutychus wasn't at church and he died. Whatever. Anyways, uh, Ephesians 1, verse number 13. Paul says it this way. Look at 12. He says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That's the trustworthy object of God, trusting in another trustworthy object himself in the form of Jesus Christ. And he says, in whom ye also trusted. Yes, you found that trustworthy object. You trusted in him. When? He says, after that, you heard the word of truth. It's trustworthy because it's true. He says, and that's the gospel of your salvation. Very personal issue there. It's your salvation. He says, in whom, after that, ye believed. You heard the gospel that Christ died for your sins. He took care of every single one of them on the cross. Every one, past, present, future, paid them all. And he imputes to you righteousness not based upon works. And you have now complete justification before him. And he says, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So as a believer, when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. And as, as he says here in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. What does earnest mean? Earnest is the, is the down payment. If anybody bought a house before, yes. When you buy a house, what happens? Don't you have to give them earnest money? And what is that earnest money really going back to do? It's mine. I own it. I'm coming back for it. You can't take it from me. It's mine. This is my place. This is my house. You're not getting it. And that's what his issue is here. It's the earnest of our inheritance until when? When does this all happen? He says, until the redemption of the purchased possession. The redemption is, as we were talking about in Romans chapter number 8, what was that redemption? Remember what he says in, in, in verse 23, the redemption of our body, right? Romans 8 says in verse 23, it's the redemption of our body. He says, with the purchase possession. What is the purchase possession? Well, in Acts chapter number 20, look at what he reads here. He's 20 verse 28. He says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. He's talking to the church at Ephesus, the elders there. And he's saying, guys, take heed. Work with these people. He says, I, didn't, I declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And in the book of Ephesians makes that clear as to that is the whole counsel of God. He says, to feed the church of God, which he hath what? Purchased with his own blood. So that's what he purchased it with. And he says, of the purchased possession in verse 14 of Ephesians 1, unto the praise of his glory. Go back with me to 2 Corinthians and we'll close here. I could talk about this stuff for another probably eight pages. But what I want you to understand first and foremost is that we can't have confidence when you have a trustworthy object, when you have faith in that object, which comes full persuasion, and then it spouts out and brings about confidence, not in your flesh. Let's look at uh, two more pieces of scripture, and we'll close here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, let's keep going here in verse number 5. Now he that wrought us for the self same thing is God. So God, who's, who's doing this, is, is God. The one that who did it through Christ is the same one that's doing it through you. And he says, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. See the earnest issue? Again, and correlating it back with Ephesians chapter 1, the earnest of the Spirit. It's the down payment. He's coming for it. He's not leaving you hanging. It's not like you're going to disappear. So what is the Holy Spirit? Is it some mystical thing? No, it's Christ in you. Now, you have to feed the Holy Spirit to make sure he understands what's going on. It doesn't matter just when you get saved. You don't magically have all knowledge of the Bible, and you go out, and you can become, you know, the next big, you know, apologetic uh, apologist. No, you have, to, you have to be established in the faith, and that comes from Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. But look what he says here in, in uh, verse 6. Therefore, as a result of everything that we said before in, in verses 1 through 5, therefore... We are, how, how confident are we? 
always confident, right? You're always confident. Not, oh, I'm confident when I feel saved. I'm confident when I really feel like I did a good job this week. No. You're confident when? Always. Because you know, here we go, here's that knowledge that precedes the confidence, that whilst we are at home in the body, right here in this body, we are absent from the Lord. That means that we're not in the presence of, of the Lord. He says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. I won't get into that. We don't have time. Verse 8, for we are confident, I say. Here's another confident in what? And willing, rather. Aren't you willing? Don't you want to go to heaven? Doesn't everybody want to go to heaven? I mean, I don't think if you ask somebody on the street, hey, uh, I'm going to interview you guys here today. Do you, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? You want to go, you want to, go to heaven. I don't think you find a single person that says, you know, I want to go to hell. Uh, I mean, maybe if they're just being stupid, they would say that. But I think the majority of people would say, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to go to heaven. Well, I can say, I can tell you confidently that I can tell you how to get there, right? Oh, that's a sin of presumption. Well, that's not a sin of presumption. I think you're misunderstanding that. Paul is making it very clear here that you are confident because it has nothing to do with you. And to the Catholic, the reason why it is a sin of presumption is why? Because they're trusting in their flesh. And your flesh has no confidence. Paul says there's, you should have no confidence in your flesh. If you think you have confidence in the flesh, I'm more. That's Philippians chapter number 3. But look what he says here. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, that's our earthly body, is to be what? Is to be present with the Lord, right? If you've had a loved one, a family member, a friend ever die, right? And you know that they were saved. Isn't the funeral kind of a joyous adventure? Isn't it like, this is, this is good times. I mean, as sad as it is to, to not see them on this earth, we know the hope in Christ, and we know that where they are, that we're confident in that, and that's where the confidence happens. So when you share the gospel with somebody, I mean, think about it for just, just a second about this. Like, I, I, I wonder how some people who, don't, who aren't confident about where they're going to spend eternity actually share the gospel. Because... What are you going to go up to somebody and say, hey, uh, would you like to maybe kind of perhaps, if you're really good enough, I don't really know if it's going to work because I'm not sure myself, but if you maybe do good, uh, you want to go to heaven? Oh, you just left me more confused than I was before. Leave me alone. You know? That's why people go, ah, Christianity, ah, ah. But what we need to do is we need to study. We need to study the word of God, and it takes time, and it's not, it's not always the most fun, but when you get going in it, it's like anything, you're like, oh, now this is really good. I really actually enjoy this. I'm learning a lot more, and it can be opened up. And not everybody's going to be, you don't all have to be preachers. You don't all have to be teachers. That's why Paul says there's some in Ephesians chapter 4, some teachers, some preachers, you know. But at the same point, it is our duty to share the gospel at the bare minimum. Our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So in closing, let me, uh, let me give you this here. This is, a, uh, this is a poem turned into a hymn uh, by a guy named uh, Catsby Paget. He was a, a Christian uh, from, I believe it was England, and he wrote this, uh, this little poem, and it says the following. It says, uh, a mind at perfect peace with God. And we don't sing hymns here, not because we don't like to sing hymns. It's because we don't have anybody that's super musically inclined. Uh, I play guitar, but I think I'm going to get Joel to sing next week maybe. <laughs> All right, we can do it. One of you guys. We'll get, we're going to get some music here going eventually, you know, when we make it happen. But a mind at perfect peace with God, it, si it states this. And think about these words. I love, I love when people take hymns and they're based upon Scripture. And it's just what the Holy Spirit has been teaching them. And it comes to this culmination of, of something that's very true. It says this. A mind at perfect peace with God. Oh, what a word is this. A sinner reconciled through blood. This, this indeed is peace. By nature and by practice far. How very far from God, yet now by grace brought nigh to him through faith in Jesus' blood. So nigh, so very nigh to God I can never be. For in the person of his Son I am as near as he. So dear, so very dear to God, more dear I cannot be. The love wherewith he loves the Son, such is his love to me. Why should I ever anxious be, since such a God is mine. He loves me night and day and tells me mine is thine. I mean, I can give you a verse for every line of that particular hymn, and that's a hymn that we would sing in this church because it's based upon scripture. So with that said, I hope that you can get some confidence. We'll probably, uh, we'll probably continue on in this next week because we still have a lot to discuss, but uh, be confident. It's, and, and it's not arrogance. Uh, we speak boldly, but we speak humbly about who we are because we're nothing. 
in our flesh, we're nothing. All we are is a sinner saved by grace, you know. So let's close in a prayer.